You are not going to believe how I solved the blinking red light of death. 8-Bit Joystick In this video, I'm going to show you how to disassemble your NES and clean the cartridge connector. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to talk about the history and the chemistry and the engineering reasons why you totally need to do this. This is going to be a rad video, so make sure that you are subscribed because I make videos like this each week. This is the Nintendo Entertainment System. Without a doubt, one of the most influential video game systems of my life, and it was beloved by millions of gamers all around the world. It was first introduced in 1985, but it wasn't a breakthrough hit until around 1986 and 1987. And over here is the Nintendo Family Computer, or Famicom. In a way, it is also the Nintendo Entertainment System. More specifically, it is the original form of Nintendo's 8-bit home game hardware as it was released in Japan in 1983. It is a remarkable masterpiece of engineering and industrial design that has almost no wasted space. It is ruthlessly efficient and has bright white and red colors with gold highlights which absolutely captures that early 1980s Japanese Showa aesthetics. But relevant to our video is that the audio cassette size game cartridges are smaller and go directly into the system at an efficient 90 degree angle and the connector pins are inside the console are easily accessible and easy to clean. First of all, unplug everything. Hit the power button on and off to discharge the capacitor. You might see a red light blink for a moment. Now in order to do this, you need a standard size 2.5 Phillips screwdriver. The screws in the NES are recessed quite a bit and you need to have a long enough regular screwdriver to do it. The smaller ones are going to be next to impossible to get in the right place and there's a chance that you can strip the screws. So in order to do this, you need a nice long regular Phillips screwdriver. There are six screws on the bottom of the console and you want to turn left to remove them. Remember, Lefty, loosey, righty, tidy, unless you're dealing with flammable gases. That last part doesn't rhyme, but it's important to know when you're hooking up propane. Also, it's okay to use a magnetic screwdriver because the NES has no internal hard drive. And you can either get the screws out by turning the console right side up, and they should just drop out. Place them in a little bowl to make sure that you don't lose them. In order to win over major American retailers who is skeptical of launching a new video game system after the American video game crash of 1983, Nintendo redesigned the Famicom into the NES and they made several major changes. They added excellent composite RCA AV output compared to the Famicom, which was RF only, and they added detachable controllers with a longer cord. But the biggest change is that the entire motherboard was redesigned to match a bigger case that has a ton of empty space and the cartridge shells were increased to be almost closer to size of a VHS cassette tape and the cartridges actually go into the system almost horizontally before being snapped into in place using a spring-loaded cartridge tray in order to resemble a VCR-like design. Instead of the tight, direct, 90 degree connection of the Famicom, the NES cartridge pins are laid loosely against the connector and normally there isn't any problems and the system works great. However, if there's a connection problem, it can be quite annoying to solve due to a trifecta of chemistry, engineering, and time that can create problems that have plagued many NES fans over the years. Then you can gently remove the light beige top half of the NES. Then you will see the upper metal RF shield. My theory is that Nintendo's engineers were a little intimidated by the American Federal Communication Commission guidelines about radio emissions, so they over-engineered the NES with very aggressive RF shields on the upper and lower sides of the console. It's also completely pointless because it's designed to help reduce RF frequency interference if someone is using a CRT with an analog antenna nearby. 
and almost no one is watching a CRT TV with an analog broadcast these days. So if you really feel like a badass, you don't have to reinstall the RF shields. The electronic manufacturers had to follow FCC guidelines in the 1980s, but you don't have to at this point. God, I hope I don't get demonetized for encouraging people not to follow completely outdated FCC guidelines from the 1980s. Personally, I've never liked the lower shield on the NES and I've always thought it was a pain in the rear since the controller and power cables are fed through it. The RF shield can also increase heat inside the system by trapping it in there. Again, the Famicom doesn't have anything like this and it's completely unnecessary. The RF shield is held in place with seven Phillips screws. And if you want, you can keep them in a separate container than the external screws. The external screws are longer than the internal screws, but they're both the same width. While Famicom cartridges had 60 pins, the NES had a 72 pin cartridge design and the additional pins were to help enable an anti-piracy lockout chip. Nintendo actually put a security chip inside each cartridge that the NES system needs to talk to before it will run the game. This was designed to prevent unauthorized cartridges from being produced, and while there still were unauthorized cartridges, it did slow their adoption and allow Nintendo to run a very successful video game business void of piracy in the US. If there are any connection problems between the cartridge and the system, the NES screen will alternate between gray and white, and the power indicator will flash off and on, indicating a connection problem. Now, in order for the system to read the game data off the cartridge, the electrons need to move freely from the metal inside the connectors on the cartridge to the metal connector pins on the console cartridge slot. A 90 degree direct connector has a much tighter direct contact than the zero force insertion 72 pin connector inside the NES that is sort of laid together instead of pressed. If there is one pin with a bad connection on the Famicom, the game will load, but some of the graphics may be glitched and will not display correctly. But if there is any connection problems with the NES, the security chip will prevent anything from playing. One of the awesome things is that TOTL Games in Portland, Oregon, where I purchased this particular NES system, severed a connector pin on the lockout chip, thus disabling the anti-piracy function of it. This can actually reduce the chance of a connection error where there isn't sufficient electrical connection between the cartridge and the system, and the screen will flash green instead of gray and black. Then you're going to see the plastic cartridge tray mechanism. It is spring-loaded and it is awesome. In order to remove the tray, you need to remove four screws that hold it in place. Then you can move the cartridge tray by sliding it forward and then setting it aside. It is important to note that there is a trapezoid-shaped lip on the front of the cartridge tray that it needs to be placed under the lower RF shield in order to be properly aligned or it can cause some bowing or stress. It can also affect cartridges from going in and locking down. If you find out that you have this problem when you're reassembling, this is probably the issue. The chemistry problem lies in corrosion specifically the power corrosive effect of oxygen. In the classic science fiction movie Gojira, Dr. Serizawa is onto something with his oxygen destroyer device. Not only is the destructive power of oxygen the only thing that can stop Godzilla, but it can stop your retro video game systems from working correctly. Over time, the slightly negatively charged oxygen molecules in the air will pick up electrons from molecules that can give them up, such as metals. Specifically, the metals on the connector pins on your cartridges and game systems, and it will slightly erode the metal. As the oxygen in the air interacts with molecules of the metal on the cartridge connector pins and on the cartridges and the consoles, they will slowly corrode and it will result in a layer of corrosion ion residue on the pins that are a little dark and it will build an electrical resistance on the metal. 
This ion residue is a result of corrosion and it will block the transfer of electrons between the two pieces of metal that are touching each other and it will prevent the chips in the game system from reading the data on the cartridge if there isn't a sufficient flow of electrons. Normally, you can clean this corrosive residue off a game cartridge with scrubbing from a Q-tip with some industrial alcohol, a toothbrush, a cleaning pad, or a rubber eraser. For a console, you can use a cleaning cartridge, and for most cartridge-based systems, you can easily get to the connector pins to clean them with an industrial alcohol-soaked toothbrush. By the way, it's important to not use first aid rubbing alcohol. It has a water concentration closer to 30% and that can actually introduce corrosion quickening water. This water can cause electrical shorts and can kill your games and systems. You want to use 99.99 .99 pure industrial alcohol. It evaporates cleanly very quickly and it's almost impossible to cause shorts since there's almost no water in it and alcohol does not conduct electricity. You can order some online, but don't drink it since it can make you go blind with nerve damage and it can kill you, but it's quite safe to work with as long as you don't drink it. Time and moisture can also greatly contribute to the rate of corrosion. Rust is the name of the oxidation of iron. All rust is corrosion, but not all corrosion is rust. By the way, Blowing on a cartridge is a terrible idea. The moisture in your breath will transfer to the pins and that can worsen the corrosion. Nine times out of 10, connection problems are not caused by dust on the cartridge. Dust can definitely impact the electrical connection, but most of the time, the problem is the result of corrosion. I am almost instantly disappointed in people who will blow onto cartridges once they know better. You might think that you are helping by taking a cartridge out and blowing on it before reinserting it. The process of unseating the cartridge and reinserting it gives you another chance to hopefully establish a better electrical connection between the metal pins, but it's a temporary fix. Eventually, it needs some deep cleaning. And then you're going to be able to see the bad boy that's been causing all the problems. The long U-shaped 72-pin connector. Now, the 72 pin connector is on there pretty tight, but it can just be slid off by having equal gentle pressure on both sides, making sure that you're not bending the board as you're pushing it back, but it should snap off. And if you want, you can remove the remaining screws that keep the motherboard attached to the lower part. The front power buttons, ribbon cables, and number two controller connectors it was entangled underneath the lower shield on my system after trying to fuss with it a bit. I greatly enjoyed removing it and throwing it away. Stick it to the FCC of the 1980s. I did it and you can too. It would also be a good time to get some clean industrial alcohol and use a Q-tip to scrub the pins on the motherboard that the cartridge connector was attached to. They can also corrode and lead to connection problems. Then it would be a good time to clean out the inside of the case and wipe out any dust and schmutz. Cleaning the cartridge often isn't enough. Over the years, an NES system will either need a deep cleaning or a replacement of the 72-pin connector. Some people think replacing the connector is best, but many of the replacement connectors don't feel the same, don't work the same, and are too tight and finicky compared to a original clean Nintendo made connector in good working order. I initially bought a 72 pin replacement connector and I was unhappy with the results and the tight fit. So I returned it to Amazon and I tried to clean and refurbish my original Nintendo made 72 pin connector. Now, some folks will swear by scrubbing the connectors gently with a fine grit sandpaper wrapped around a card to remove the corrosive residue built up on the metal pins. This works by using mechanical force to physically remove the residue manually, but it runs the risk of bending or breaking the pins that can be a little tricky to reach all of them. Now, some folks swear by soaking the 72-pin connector overnight in a sealed container filled with vinegar. 
Vinegar is a mild acid and it will dissolve the bonds of the corrosive residue. Just remember to wash the vinegar off with water and let the connector dry by wiping it down before letting it air dry for an hour or more. It has to be 100% bone dry or it can cause an electrical short that can kill your game or system. I recently cleaned the rust off a sink filter using this method and it worked great. Plus, it smelled pleasantly of pickles. But the method that I used here was to boil the 72 pin connector in water on the stove for 5 minutes. Just take off the removed connector and bring a pot of water to a rolling boil on the stove. Then submerge the connector and just let it boil for about 5 to 10 minutes, making sure to move it with tongs or chopsticks to ensure that the plastic part of the connector doesn't start to melt. I boiled mine for about 5 minutes and set a timer. Then I removed it from the water with tongs, making sure not to touch the hot metal. Remember kids, hot metal looks an awful lot like cool metal. <laughs> I've made that mistake before. Then take a cleaning cartridge or non-expensive game and plug it in and remove it a couple times to add some mechanical force to remove any remaining corrosive residue. And then let it cool and dry before reinstalling it. It would also be a good idea to dump out the water and wash your pot so it doesn't make it taste like a 37 year old metal ion residue. So after you have sufficiently cleaned the 72 pin connector you can just snap it back on ensuring that you get it on the right way. The top part that connects to the cartridge sticks out a little bit more than the lower part that connects to the motherboard. Again it has to be absolutely bone dry. Use even pressure on both sides and it should just snap on. Then take the cartridge tray and slide it in ensuring that the trapezoid part is properly aligned under the lip before screwing it down. Or be a total badass and not include the lower RF shield and don't worry about it as long as it is properly aligned. Then make sure that the front buttons and the controller connectors are connected. Now would be a good time to test it using a variety of cartridges and play with it for a little bit and just make sure that you're happy with your work. It was at this point that I realized that I was unhappy with my new 72 pin connector and I wanted to try cleaning the old one instead. This might be a case where the old one is better than a new one, but it might take some time to wear in if you're just going to go with a new one. Sometimes the old ones are just beyond redemption, but I was able to restore my old one by boiling it. Before you continue, unplug the AC adapter and AV cables and discharge the capacitor by hitting the power button on and off again. Then you want to go in reverse order and screw down the motherboard after you've properly aligned it. Add the upper RF shield and then place the top half and keep it together as a console sandwich before flipping it over and attaching the bottom six screws. And then go test it out on the TV again and crack open a refreshing beverage of your choice and play some Nintendo games. I would like to give a special thanks to my father, who is a retired atomic chemist and chemistry professor. He previewed this video script. I would like to list him as a scientific consultant, and he also bought me my first NES system back in late 1986. Well, I make videos like this each week that come out every Saturday at 9am, so you better subscribe so you don't miss them. This is 8-Bit Joystick. Stay awesome. Play retro. This cat is yelling. I will lock you as soon as I'm done with this video.